welcome everybody to Indigenizing Your Curriculum. This is a webinar about the educational and curricular materials developed by the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. It's also the last in a webinar series uh, that was put together by the New Hampshire Farmer School Network and the New Hampshire School and Youth Garden Network. Today's presenters include Elaine Marhefka, who's an adjunct instructor in UNH, UNH's education department, Aaron DeRosier, a student um, of Elaine's and uh, a student at in UNH's education department, myself, Stacy Perslow, the New Hampshire Farm to School Program Coordinator, and um, Paul and Denise Puglio, head speakers of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. So welcome everybody. And I'm gonna stop screen share and turn it over to Paul and Denise who will officially welcome you all here. Denise Puglio, Sagamasqua. Wood Delawison, Paul Puglio, Sagamo, Kawasak Band of the Pentecook Adnaki people. Niona Aian Odenaku Nipi. Hello, friends. My name is Denise Puglio, head female speaker, and this is Paul Puglio, head male speaker and chief of the Kawasak Band of the Pentecook Adnaki people. We are speaking from our headquarters at Odenaku Nipi, which translates to the village at the narrowing of the waters, now known as Alton, New Hampshire, within our Indakina. We sang in Dakina, our homelands, thanks to all our relations, thanks to the great mystery of life, the creator. We'll now share the UNH land, water, and life acknowledgement. As we all journey on the trail of life, we wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to in Dakina, our homeland, and the Aki, land, Nebi, water, Olakwikak, flora, and Awa'asak, fauna, which the University of New Hampshire community is honored to steward today. We also acknowledge the hardships they continue to endure after the loss of unceded homelands and champion the university's responsibility to foster relationships and opportunities that strengthen the well being of the indigenous people who carry forward the traditions of their ancestors. Kitsi Olini, Kitsi Nawasta, Minikwil Daminana, Olido Gawangan, Olioni. Great thanks, Creator, and we remember still, thanks to our relations. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. So I'm going to now turn it over to Elaine and Aaron. Great, thank you. Um, so our purpose today is to share some of the resources that INHCC has put together. And so who is INHCC? Uh, INHCC is a grassroots movement of community members from diverse cultural backgrounds working to reframe New Hampshire's heritage um, 
through uh, truth and research and collaboration. Uh, INHCC is not a tribe and does not speak on behalf of indigenous peoples, but rather stands in solidarity with indigenous peoples. Uh, in 2016, it began as a small collaboration between the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki tribal leaders uh, here today, uh, UNH faculty and undergraduate students. Uh, all of the resources that we'll be sharing today are available at uh, indigenous um, NewHampshire.com, uh, and all of them are free to the public. Go to the next slide. Great. Um, so we're going to start with this resource guide because it's really a great place to start your investigation as you are uh, looking to add um, indigenous ideas, practices, histories into your curriculum, or you're looking to see the ways that you have integrated um, this work in the past. It really helps you put a lens on kind of the do's and don'ts of how to approach curriculum uh, and what materials are available to you that have been vetted um, within different indigenous communities. Um, so this guide was developed in the summer um, by INHCC and is adapted from the Portland Public Schools Wabanaki Studies Guide. Um, and so it's been adapted to be relevant to uh, New Hampshire and the local um, Kawasak Band uh, materials and um, uh, indigenous perspectives. Um, so today our job will be to introduce this to you and then also show you how it applies to the resources um, that have been created by INHCC and how you might be able to use them. Uh, our activities will center around um, the season of spring as many of the resources are um, focused on seasonal practices. Um, so today we'll be focusing in on the spring season and looking at different fish related activities and resources together. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. The two main goals of the guide um, are to first outline important considerations, as I mentioned when introducing Indigenous content, uh, as part of your self-reflection, um, discussion with colleagues, and consideration of the students um, or learners that you're working with in your educational setting. Uh, and secondly, it offers a centralized list of pre-vetted regionally specific resources for use in the classroom. Uh, we all know as teachers that can be one of the hardest things is tracking down resources. And so this guide localizes it and uh, collects all of these resources in one place for you to use to uh, inform yourself and then also your students. Um, so the two primary sections that we'll outline a little bit uh, is the before lesson planning begins as well as the recommended resources. So for the recommended resources in the guide uh, is a progression kind of through your experience and where you're beginning um, in your process of indigenizing your curriculum. Uh, it includes curriculum guides that have already been created by various organizations, including as well as lesson plans, uh, as well as uh, websites um, and student literature. Um, so there are picture books, storytelling, um, information or resources uh, and as well as the resources to again inform you um, at the teacher educator level. Uh, we'll be looking at one of the films that uh, has been vetted and created by INHCC um, today that can be a great resource to use in your classroom. There's also reference to maps um, that we'll be showing you embedded in a lesson, as well as resources around Thanksgiving and Indigenous Peoples Day and how to approach those holidays um, in a you know, cultural appreciation lens. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so during the section of before lesson planning begins, this um, taking the time for self-reflection, considering these questions. And obviously you being here today, you are already you know, investigating how you might indigenize your curriculum. Uh, and so we're all in different uh, spaces in our learning and comfortability in our curriculum. Um, so we really hope that you walk away today um, being able to consider some of these questions and how the resources will inform these. Um, so so 
starting off, how do you think about, or how do I think about my own positionality with respect to indigenous studies? How have I and my family been impacted, perhaps by settler colonialism or indigenous displacement? Or how have my ancestors benefited from these historical processes? Have I or my ancestors been harmed? Uh, how does learning and teaching about them make me feel and why? And what is my level of knowledge in indigenous studies? And so this initial self-reflection can really help think about um, your positionality as you're entering into this work, uh, as well as be a reminder throughout the work as you're vetting, you're vetting your resources and experiences and um, your student uh, reactions to the material. So thanks. Uh, Again, there's a, a section in resources about cultural appropriation um, and what it is and what it is not. Um, and so the definition cultural appropriation is taking and using indigenous images, ideas, knowledge and material for purposes that hurt or damage the indigenous community from which it belongs. Conversely, if we think, as I mentioned about cultural appreciation, it uses this knowledge to benefit, build and partner with the indigenous community from where it comes from. And this lens can be a productive way as you're evaluating um, materials for your students um, to make sure that we it does not involve any sort of cultural appropriation. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to go in a little more depth um, following Aaron's discussion of one of the um, resources of the 13 Moons curriculum that are available to you from INHCC. And I'm just going to be outlining a few of the do's that are incorporated in the do's and don'ts section, um, which includes very explicit language about, you know, ways to be respectful um, to the indigenous communities that you're learning about. Uh, and so we'll just look at some examples of how to do that. Some of the key themes um, surrounding these do's and don'ts for comparison are language and terminology, approach, resources, uh, incorporating guest speakers, um, stories and storytelling, indigenous students, and spirituality and religion. Um, so you can look at some examples as well as some linked resources um, that go into a little more depth um, as to why it's a do or a don't. Um, so we'll look closely at that um, with one of the lesson examples. And with that, I will turn it over to Erin. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I am a student at UNH and I had the opportunity to work on some of these um, lessons that we're gonna talk about in the 13 Moons curricul curriculum, how they're structured. Um, so the 13 Moons curriculum is based on the Abenaki people's seasonal practices, and it strives to connect um, these traditional practices to students' lives today. And Stacy's going to talk a little more about the harvest calendar that the lessons are inspired by later um, in the presentation. The lessons are designed, uh, we were designed with the help of University of New Hampshire students um, and current and prior members of the INHCC. These lessons are a work in progress. So there's always activities being added and developed. And we continually seek to develop other topics and curriculums that are relevant to today's teachers and encourage feedback from you um, on the lesson plans that are already available. If I could have the next slide. So uh, each lesson begins with a land acknowledgement and an invitation to explore. And this is presented in student-friendly language and incorporate, incorporates um, Abenaki language and pronunciations, which I'm going to attempt as we keep going through this section. So each lesson is designed with um, multiple age groups in mind. We'll have explorations that are meant to target early elementary school children, and then an extension that will um, continue engagement with the upper elementary school students. Um, they're meant to promote curiosity and understanding of the Abenaki people and culture in the contemporary times and in the past. And there's a lot of guiding, great guiding questions so that you can make connections with students, um, between the activities they're doing and the 13 moons calendar. Also, as part of this, we've connected all of our 
C3 next generation science standards and common core standards for math and literacy where it's applicable. And there's the lessons all include additional resources for educators, um, readings you can do and background information before you teach your lesson. So they, the, the, the other great thing about the lessons is they really promote um, hands-on activities. And one example of this is there a lesson that, there's a lesson that corresponds with the Zatakikas or the blueberry moon that includes instructions for making pemmican, which is a food that's made with dried fruit and seeds and fat um, that was made by um, Abenaki people as an easy high energy um, food to store and eat during the Pabon, which is the winter months. Um, and there's, there's links to videos um, showing the process and the materials, ingredients, I guess, that you would use to make pemmican. So you could do that with your students. And um, one extension act activity in the Sigwa, ooh, let me try this one, Sigwa Kas, where the spring maker moon, Lesson students are um, guided through weaving a fishnet, which is something Denise is going to share with you later. If you could give me the new slide. Another um, great part of the lessons is uh, the op encouraging students to get outdoors and to observe the natural world and the, our connection to the land. So a couple of examples of outdoor activities that are in our lessons. So as part of the Pigagon Dagus or the falling branch moon, students will go out and explore the winter landscape to uncover evidence of animals that are active in the winter months. And um, we have a couple of connections to the UNH Extension School and the New Hampshire Fishing Game site that will provide you with materials to help you identify that evidence of animals with your students. Another um, activity we have in the lessons during the Pa Bi Bagus moon, the falling leaf moon lesson, students will be going outside and gathering leaves and doing like a leaf rubbing. So it's also hands on um, and being able to go back and identify the trees through their leaves um, using the Northeast Trees Identification Guide, which is pictured here and it was created by the um, Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. Um, the, it also includes the Abenaki English and French names for all of the trees. And Elaine's gonna talk a little more about the do's and don'ts, but I also wanted to thank her and um, Denise and Paul for all the great information that I've been learning this whole year. So take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you. And thank you for your amazing work as well, Erin. Uh, so walking through just a few of the do's briefly um, that were also highlighted um, in Erin's lessons that she mentioned. This is what the do's and don'ts look like in the guide. Um, again, very explicit language to be able to compare your materials and your in your planning process. Um, so example one being a surrounding language and terminology. Um, and so do use names of specific tribes and communities whenever possible. Um, and also do use the term indigenous when in need of a collective term. Although Native American is also widely used and accepted, indigenous is often preferable because it is more accurate, inclusive, and is unbound by colonial borders. Um, so to look at an example, uh, Stacy, sorry, next slide. Um, each of the lesson plans, uh, as Erin mentioned, have Abenaki words to know um, that Paul and Denise have been informing us and teaching us about um, so that you have the Abenaki word, the pronunciation, and then the familiar word where students um, can be encouraged to hear, practice, and learn familiar words uh, in the Abenaki language when learning about the practices. So the second example of what to do is, uh, as Erin alluded to, centering your inquiry around the environment, the land, the landscape, uh, and the indigenous people's relationship to it. Um, and so making sure that students get out, uh, out 
outside and really noticing things in their environment. Sorry, next slide. Um, so in this example, um, this is another lesson plan from the 13 moons guide and related to our theme of fish. Uh, and this lesson is um, swimming in spring with the river herring. Uh, and it really emphasizes the importance of fish and fishways and the stewardship of fishways um, from the Abenaki perspective. Uh, and so the do of encourage student interaction with outdoor spaces and the natural environment, each Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so encouraging interaction with the outdoor spaces. This example of the slide is uh, the lesson affordances. And so each lesson, um, in addition to um, the, uh, in addition to the standards and the language of the standards, each lesson also has specific affordances uh, in student and teacher friendly language. In this case, for this lesson, students will be learning how rivers are connective pathways for travel, communication and resources. Uh, and students will understand what and who these pathways connect by looking at some different maps that I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and they'll explore a map of where the Abenaki people traveled by way of land, as well as by way of water. So they will, they'll be doing this again by the hands-on experiential aspect of simulating fish, in this case, the river herring uh, movement. Um, and so by simulating that, they'll be thinking about what it's like to travel um, through these fishways. Uh, and um, students will also understand the importance of these waterways to the Abenaki people and the river herring all year and during the spring. Again, we're focused on the spring, um, but this was an important resource um, for the Abenaki people all year long. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is an example of uh, many of the lessons have associated slides for those of you whose students uh, really appreciate visuals uh, in addition to discussions or uh, literature uh, and experiences. So this is one example, again, the swimming in spring with the river herring. Uh, and um, Stacy will be talking a little bit more about the anadromist um, designation of this type of fish in her activity from the harvest calendar in a moment. Next slide. Uh, so this exploration for this lesson starts with a question, how does the land shape how people move across natural spaces? Uh, and so each lesson has the ask and discuss uh, questions that you can pose to students um, during and following the uh, experiential activities. So in this case, what you'll be doing with your students is bringing them outside to whatever the learning space looks like. So for some of you, that might be an outdoor trail. For some of you, that might be a field or a playground. Um, and getting them to look at the landscape and look at what are the ways people are moving and navigating this landscape? What are the patterns? How is it being used? Um, what areas are used or less used? And what are the landmarks or landforms um, that you notice? And so then students will take that experience um, experience back into the classroom and uh, explore the context of how that connects to the Abenaki community. Uh, next slide. So we'll, we'll bring them in and again, continue with the discussion by looking at this map. Now, yes, it is hard to read. However, all of those black lines are representing Abenaki travel on land. Uh, and so they're considered the Abenaki trails. And so as you're talking about the students uh, movement and understanding of the landscape, we can make this connection to think about, okay, where do you find your neighborhood on this map? Um, and to really emphasize that for thousands of years, these uh, trails were and are used um, and to make that personal um, connection and understanding um, to the place and the landscape it's, itself. Next slide. And this also applies to traveling through waterways. Um, and again, these maps are also available in, in different places at the INHCC uh, resources. Um, so, you know, we like to use lots of different resources to emphasize um, these big, 
big ideas and themes. Um, so this map can be used to have students identify where the waterways are um, and look at the, um, the different rivers and ways of travel by water as well, which will connect to under getting to know the river herring um, and where the river herring would travel in the spring to spawn. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so connected to that, our, our third example of what to do, as we mentioned in the recommended resources, um, do be mindful of the resources that you're using. There are many mediocre, inaccurate, and downright harmful resources out there. Please take the time to ask a few questions before using the resource. So these questions you can apply, again, when you're looking um, for uh, what you already have or what you're creating, who wrote it and when, what perspective is it elevating? How are native peoples represented? Is it from a reliable source of information? And that's where we're hoping, again, those recommended resources can answer a lot of those questions for you um, quickly. So great, Stacy is going to queue up a section of this documentary, Swimming Upstream, that was created by INHCC, uh, entitled, Swimming Upstream Indigenous Environmental Justice for Our Waterways. And so this section is chosen um, for you to view. And this would be a section that um, for this investigation, you would show to your students to help them understand a little bit more context about what the river herring uh, is, looks like, and why it's important to this area. for millennia, and when looking at the calm waters today, it is hard to imagine the complex relationships between all the living organisms that call this land, water, and air their home. River herring are vital to the ecology of freshwater, estuarine, and marine environments. Both alewives and the bluebacks connect our ocean, rivers, and lakes by providing nutrients and forage needed to make healthy watersheds. As the river herring migrates through these distinct habitats, it becomes part of a complex ecosystem in which it provides nourishment for countless other species. River herring are enjoyed by striped bass, bluefish, tuna, cod, haddock, American eel, seabirds, bald eagle, osprey, great blue heron, whales, seals, otter, mink, fox, skunk, weasel, raccoon, fisher, and turtles. Additionally, the river herring has nourished the people which have fished them throughout history. The waterways and surrounding land of what would become the seacoast region of New Hampshire contains archaeological evidence that proves permanent indigenous settlements were located here, in Indakina. After long, harsh winters, individuals would move in familial bands from the mountain regions to the coastline. Here, they would build wigwams for dwellings and gather food from the Aki, land, and Nebi, water. The geography along the Piscataqua River and around Great Bay provided abundant fishing nut-bearing trees, and berry bushes. The flat land along the riverbanks may have been used for agriculture. On a consistent, seasonal basis, the rivers brought the early inhabitants to this area. At this time, fishing weirs would have been used to catch the river herring, which would have then been used as either bait for other fishing, including lobstering, or for consumption. River herring are easily smoked as a means of preserving the fish for later in the year. A weir is an obstruction made typically of wood or stone, which is placed in tidal waters to direct the passage of, or trap, fish. The river herring, who were swimming downstream after breeding, would become trapped in the barrier during low tide. Weirs were not fixed structures and would be removed seasonally to ensure the juveniles could migrate to the ocean. For indigenous communities, the earth and its abundance is a sacred resource. 
The land, water, and air must be cared for as it supports life, where each of those elements must work in harmony with one another. For the people of Indakina, this fostered a sense of steward. Great, thank you. Um, so that documentary um, also um, includes an educational package um, that has different activities to use um, with discussion with adults, discussion with children. Um, and so this is just an image of the conversation guide. So um, if you were to watch the whole film, you can consider what's the difference between a dam and a fishing weir? How do their purposes differ? How do they affect the environment differently? Um, uh, and so you can be, you know, using the resources in lots of different ways, depending on um, your the age of your students and and their interests. Um, but that again is uh, just a wonderful film um, for all ages, and that is also available. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you, Elaine. Um, some good information there. Um, if anybody has any questions about anything that that we're talking about, please put it in the chat. We hope to also have some time at the end for some questions and discussion. So now let's move on to the Indigenous Harvest Calendar. So this was a collaborative project between New Hampshire Farm to School and the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. Uh, so it's a seasonal harvest calendar highlighting different foods of the Abenaki. So all of the food items you can see on the top and bottom of the slide. And it's broken up into the four seasons. These posters are um, available for download. Um, you can print them uh, for free, uh, either on the Farm to School website or the indigenousnh.com website. And so this is an example of some of the activities. So each food item has uh, activities that goes along with it. And so maple syrup, we just finished maple season here in New Hampshire. So I wanted to highlight that as one of the activities for spring or end of winter, spring. Um, so you can learn about maple syrup, um, nutrition information, maple syrup traditionally links to other resources um, the Abenaki connection with the story of Guscabe and maple syrup. So thinking about oral traditions and storytelling. So you have the story in the activities, which you could read to your students, but there's also a link to a podcast. So Paul Puglio uh, narrating the story, if you would rather have Paul read it to your students, is there. Um, one of the other activities, since we have a fish and water theme for, for this uh, webinar, a salmon is one of the summer um, foods. Uh, and we talked about migration, a herring and migration that Elaine talked about um, and fishing weirs and anadromous and catadromous. So some of the same content uh, that's in the herring activity you can find in the salmon activity. Um, and so one of the activities is uh, identifying anadromous and catadromous fish. And we're gonna actually try to do that via a jam board um, since we, we're not in person to do this activity. So what I'm gonna do is drop a link into the chat. Um, so if you all click on the link to the jam board, You should see a slide that has an Atlantic salmon on it and anadromous and catadromous on either side. So basically what we're gonna do is I'm gonna to read to you about three different fish species and then you're going to decide whether it's anadromous or catadromous and how you're going to interact with the Jamboard is to use your mouse to go down and grab one of the dots or the bubbles and click and not the salmon, click and drag it up um, to your choice of answer, anadromous or catadromous. So let me read um, 
about Atlantic salmon. So Atlantic salmon are the only salmon native to the Atlantic Ocean. Depending on the size of the female, Atlantic salmon produce about 2,500 to 7,000 eggs. Atlantic salmon leave the ocean to return to freshwater streams and rivers to breed. In the United States, Atlantic salmon were once native to almost every river north of the Hudson River. Due to the effects of industrial and agricultural development, including habitat destruction, dams, and historic overfishing, most populations native to New England were eradicated. Now the only native populations of Atlantic salmon in the United States are found in Maine. They were caught by Native Americans before the first settlers arrived and commercial fisheries for Atlantic salmon started in Maine during the 1600s. In 2000, NOAA Fisheries and the US Fish and Wildlife Service listed the Gulf of Maine distinct population segment of the Atlantic salmon as endangered under the Endangered Species Acts. Substantial efforts are ongoing to restore wild Atlantic salmon and their habitat. These including improving fish passage by removing or modifying dams so salmon can reach freshwater spawning and rearing areas critical to their survival. Understanding and improving historically low salmon survival in the ocean and supplementing wild populations with hatchery raised salmon. So I should read what catadromous and anadromous actually mean before you guess. So anadromous is the term that describes fish born in freshwater who spend most of their lives in salt water and return to freshwater to spawn. And catadromous meaning they spend most of their adult life in freshwater, but return to the sea to spawn. So based on what I read about Atlantic salmon, are they anadromous or catadromous? So yeah, just use your mouse to go down and grab a circle and drag it to which answer you think it is. Yeah, so fantastic. Most of you are correct. So we're going to try another one. So what you want to do is above the picture of the Atlantic salmon, you'll see a box that has one slash eight, and then there's an arrow to the right. So you want to click on that arrow so you can go to the next frame. And the next frame, you should see the American eel. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to read about the American eel, and then you're going to decide whether it's catadromous or anadromous. So the American eel are reported to have been eaten by the Mi'kmaq, Eastern and Western Abenaki, Northern Iroquois, Penobscot, Rappahannock, Onondaga, and Plateau Indigenous peoples. Eels were caught mainly in the fall. A variety of tools were used to catch them, including spears, nets, fish weirs, and hook and line. The ear, eels were eaten, roasted or smoked, and dried for consumption later. The American eel lives in fresh or brackish water as an adult and then migrates into the ocean to spawn. American eel eggs hatch in the Sargasso Sea and the Gulf Stream delivers them to the river systems along east coast of North America. These young eels are carried on ocean currents until they reach the coastline where they tra transform into glass eels and then begin swimming upstream. As they move upstream, glass eels transform again into elvers. Upon reaching their freshwater destination, the elvers trans transform once more into yellow eels. They will grow and mature in rivers until they journey back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. For some, this journey can be close to 3,000 miles. During their journey, they don't eat, and after they spawn, they die. So what is your guess? Are American eels catadromous or anadromous? Yeah, fantastic. They're catadromous. So that's one of the activities included in the Indigenous Harvest calendar that you could do in your classroom. It's, it's one of the activities that I, in our Zoom world these days that I adapted to be able to show and uh, for you to participate in. Um, 
So thank you for that. And we can go back to our um, slideshow. Okay. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Paul and Denise. Why everyone. So we get um, the fun part of the hands on activities. Um, this is one of the things that we really like to do with the children uh, when we gather everyone together. Um, we find that uh, through hands on activities, the children absorb more because they make an actual connection with the with the subject in which we're learning. So we recognize that not everyone has um, the materials that we do to create some of the activities. So what we did is we created some worksheets um, that describe some of the um, activities and 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 it also includes ways that you can do these activities at your home or school using resources that are already available to you. So during this time of year, one of the things that we'd be doing would be um, we would be making our birch bark canoes. Um, and so one of the this activity that we're showing you here is how to make a paper canoe um, that your students can uh, decorate in their own way. Um, this canoe is designed uh, that if you fold where the dotted lines are appropriately that the canoe will sit on on top of the table without tipping over. Um, so this is just one of the hands on activities. Um, next, please. The next slide we're showing is um, is on how to make fish nets. Uh, staying with the fish theme um, of this webinar, um, we created a, a worksheet that showed the indigenous way of how to make fish nets, which included instructions um, and the di and diagrams uh, to show how this process was is completed. Um, these diagrams are available on the website. Um, next slide. Along, yeah, along with these, with the diagram, we created a video to show how to actually make the fish net. Go ahead.
And that's it for my small segment on fish um, crafting. So we'll leave it open to questions. Thank you, Paul and Denise. Um, yeah, any questions anybody has about any of the content that we show today? Um, all of these resources can be found on the indigenousnewhampshire.com website. Um, a couple of questions we also had for the group is um, wondering if there are other resources that you're looking for that we might be able to help create. Um, particularly, uh, we have a lot of resources for younger students. Um, if there are resources you're looking for for high school age, um, that would be good information to know uh, because we, we do have an education and working group uh, that all of us participate in. So part of what we do is develop resources. Um, and then another question is how, how can we support you in adopting some of these curriculum and activities into your classrooms? Uh, so one question, are there other similar programs in other New England states? Um, there is not an INHCC entity in other states. Um, I think there are other states that are working on developing some um, indigenous materials for schools. I know, again, we said earlier that we adopted our Indigenizing Your Curriculum Guide from the Portland Maine School District. So they have some um, activities in that school district. Um, I think Vermont is working on some things. Um, so I don't know about all the states, but. Um, Nicole wants to know, are there folks interested in visiting classrooms or helping to establish outdoor classrooms that highlight these aspects of outdoor education? Absolutely, I would love to do that. That's, um, and Nicole, I know, um, I think that would be wonderful. And if that, again, to Stacy's question is something that we can support and we can figure out, you know, the infrastructure for that, you know, um, I would love to um, talk to you more about that. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts to add to that. We agree. Um, we would love to come out and assist in developing a program like that and maybe even create a worksheet on how to do it <laughs> <laughs> for, other, for other schools. If, so um, yeah, this we look at it as another opportunity uh, to uplift our community as a whole. For, for decades, we've been going into schools. Um, a lot of our, our projects are scalable from, uh, from K up through 12. Some of our things that we do, even this fish net making, could be uh, brought to high school level. I mean, it's just the scale of the thing is such that we could, you could have a whole classroom making up a large fishnet. Uh, some of the other things that we do do have to do with musicology and it, it's like ageless. We could, we, we show uh, indigenous music and dance and other things. So we've been doing this for decades before INHCC. So we have quite a bit of, you know, experience of what works in the classroom. And we've been doing it for so long that we, we actually started to doing um, uh, some metrics on what's more effective. You know, what are we entertaining? Or are we educating sometimes? So we're always interested in, in the metrics that educators want to look at. So we, uh, yeah, we agree. We could, we should be doing more, but it, we have so many, so few people that can actually do this that we feel comfortable putting them in the school. Uh, Mary wants to know who works at Prescott Farm in Laconia. Um, we will be using our heritage garden to focus on native foods and the contributions of native foods to all of our diets. A lot of the people who use and visit the garden will be adults. Do you have any other suggestions or resources for indigenous foods, especially as it relates to educating adults and families? So I'm just going to pipe up and say the harvest, got, um, harvest Food Guide 
that was done with uh, in collaboration with Farm to School uh, talks a lot about the um, foods that we ate and gives activities surrounding those foods. One of the things with indigenous foods is uh, our palates have changed quite a bit. A lot of our corn that we grew, you know, we, we talk a lot about the three sisters. These were hard flint corns that were uh, us usually made into uh, flowers and, uh, and, and, and meal. So when we look at these indigenous gardens, we have to wrap our head around what we were using it for back then. And there were certain things which were wildcrafted, like fiddleheads and uh, the sun chokes, which we call Jerusalem artichokes, were, were literally uh, taken from the ground and used uh, almost on the spot. So there are different categories of things that would work in a farm environment. We caution people with the artichokes or the Jerusalem artichokes, sun chokes, because they're very aggressive and they're very, um, they can be invasive if, if you let them have the right soil conditions. So we always caution people about that. In the Three Sisters, it, it's, it's a more of an art form on how to grow it appropriately because there's a differential in, in growing patterns and you have to choose the right species of corn, beans, and squash to make a successful garden. Uh, we're looking all the time at the heirloom ones, the Abnaki Rose and the Abnaki Calais corns are the ones that we, we know were historically correct but they are uh, flint corns, not the type you just, you know, pull off the, off the stalk and eat. So uh, be mindful of that. And uh, yeah, you can experiment with indigenous foods quite a bit. Uh, your best bet is beans and squash because almost all the heirlooms you think are uh, genetically modified heirlooms, they're not. A lot of these actually have long, deep roots in New, uh, New England's uh, uh, biosphere, if you want to call it that. So when you look at a lot of your heirloom squashes today, they probably had indigenous uh, back roots. Any other questions on gardening? <laughs> All right. Edith says, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sarah wants to know, how about actual cooking lessons? <laughs> All right, open fire cooking. Um, I could write a book on open fire cooking. The problem is, unless you're actually out there doing it, um, it's not going to work. So, you know, open fire cooking is a skill that you literally have to learn by practicing. Um, because it's about getting the food close enough or far enough away from the heat source, turning it at certain periods of time, you know, to make sure uh, things cook evenly. Um, but we have not created, um, I don't think we've created any educational resources yet on how to cook um, or preserve in the indigenous way. Um, we well, could look at a pemmican. The pemmican is one of those yeah, things we where we pemmican, but that's not like cooking, cooking. When we did the pemmican, we, we knew we could have done it with like uh, raw moose meat or yeah. raw, raw venison or, or bear fat. But we, we knew that wasn't a practical approach. So we used nothing but uh, grain, you know, like uh, sunflower seed, uh, various nuts. nut meats and to for... substitute that for the, for the, for the oils that would come out of uh, meat flesh and we use berries. So that's one of the processed foods that creates like these fruit bars. Um, we call it pemmican, which was an old Abnaki or actually an old Algonquin word, which meant we kind of mixed things. Uh, most of our cuisine was boiled pot type of meals. Imagine uh, some kind of container that was constantly at the fire and uh, was always boiling water and throwing in bits and pieces of game and things that came into the community would be thrown in there and cooked over a time period. So we, a lot of the things were stews like succotash. Uh, they were uh, like succotash originally was nothing more than a, uh, a flint corn that was soaked at the same time as hard beans and then made into a, a like a bean or a corn soup. So a lot of our things that were cooking, we were kind of very simplistic about cooking. We didn't use spices in that way. We really didn't fry foods uh, in the sense that we put things in oils. A lot of things were boiled, dried, sun dried or fire dried or smoked. smoked. And uh, in preservatives were usually limited to certain berries that we used, spice bush being one of them, which has a uh, 
antibacterial ca uh, quality, and we would pound that in the pemmican. So the spice bush is very much like all spice, but with another oil in it. And when that mixed with the meats, it actually preserved it and made it like a dried, um, like a dried Italian sausage or something like that. So when you really look at how we, we use the resources, we use berries, we use uh, raw products, and th there was not an awful lot of um, what you'd think is conventional cooking or baking. None of that really happened. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, baking, it, well, a lot of it was done on flat rocks, and it would probably look more like uh, Middle Eastern food, you know, uh, unleavened bread and things like that. So we did uh, a different kind of cooking style, and it wasn't European for sure. Uh, we could go on and on, but it's we've been giving recipes to various restaurants and cookbooks, and we've been doing that. And the most recent one was we gave some recipes for the Tamworth Distillery, which I'm waiting to see how that comes out. Nice. Um, but we, we're always working with restaurants trying to reinvent their menus to include indigenous foods. And it's been pretty successful uh, when uh, you know, restaurateurs or chefs want to indigenize their culture. We, we give them some some uh, seasonal things like the fiddleheads and the, and the artichokes are very seasonal and very short-lived. So those are great for these upscale restaurants that want to add a little difference, you know, differences into their, their menus. Right. Is it appropriate for me to give a shameless plug? <laughs> Go for it. All right. There um, on June 19th, it's a Sunday, um, there's going to be a farm acute, which is farm to table. Um, food that's it's a heritage food festival cookout. Uh, we we're, we're supplying um, four recipes uh, for these master chefs to create on the premises. Um, it's at uh, Tucker Tuckaway Farm in Lee, um, and so uh, one of the chefs happens to be the newly uh, well new recrowned I guess um, Iron Chef um, uh, David Vargas. Um, so it should be a really yummy event if you're interested um, in some indigenous recipes. Thank you. Yes, I've attended that event in the past. So it's a, a fun day full of delicious food. Um, all right, that is all we have time for today. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, this session has been recorded and will be uh, available on the New Hampshire Farm to School website, along with the other webinars that we've done this past winter and spring. And um, thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.